morning. Good morning, everyone. Hi, good morning. Hi, good morning. Hi. All right. Um, Very good morning. Thank you for coming in this morning. Okay. I am O'Neill, the coordinator of today's session and also the coordinating member of Malaysia Project Management Community. It gives me an immense pleasure to welcome you all to this session on generative AI for real-world application. Build your own next-gen AI system. We are co-hosting this event with NVIDIA and Novarians and Jumper Hut. Our speaker for today's event is Dr. Johan Bartolami, the Developer Relations Manager of NVIDIA. Dr. Johan has extensive experience in the field of AI and is an expert in developing AI solutions for various applications. So during Dr. Johan's presentation, participants can type your questions in the chat box. After Johan, Dr. Johan's presentation, we will have a Q&A session. During the presentation, and media would also like to hear your feedback. So please complete the simple feedback form posted in the chat box at the end of this session. So let me invite Dr. Atikan, Chief Technologies, Asia Pacific South region from NVIDIA to give us a welcoming message. Over to you, Dr. Atikan. Thank you, Onil. Uh, and also uh, thanks to No Orion to uh, coordinate and organize this uh, together. Uh, we very much appreciate uh, this effort put together. And uh, it's not really a welcoming speech, just that I would say more to thank you to all the organizers who helped us. I think it's very important uh, for, for us to, to understand uh, AI, the impact of AI, especially in the space of uh, large language model. That is the intention of the talk today that we're going to cover. And uh, uh, what we see is, of course, uh, ChatGPT is a famous application which brought us uh, into a storm of understanding what exactly large language model. Uh, but in this session is going to go a bit more deeper from uh, you, not be, I mean, not a user perspective, but a bit more as a uh, beyond user, as also a developer and a probably AI scientist or AI engineer or AI developer, so that you understand how the large language model can be. Uh, uh, can be trained on your own uh, and uh, after training the model you can actually even customize it or g-tune it prompt unit for your own use cases and scenario then how can you successfully deploy this for your own business cases regardless of whether uh, you are a banking industry you are in a telco industry you are a, in a, you know tourism industry or any any industries right uh, it'll be something applicable uh, and also localized for a specific uh, content. So what we see regionally, the big uptake is uh, chat GDP is good. Uh, you know, it, it's just, uh, it's a lot of data has been shared uh, uh, to chat GPT application or uh, any language model is one example of it. But localization of the data is essential so that people can interact and understand, uh, in this case, uh, Malaysia much better uh, so that the, the model has a local knowledge and insight uh, to give a meaningful response uh, to the user who is trying to understand a region or specific uh, uh, information. So the journey today is a bit more uh, going into deeper how you can do that, localize it for your own use cases, scenario, business case, and content before you can successfully deploy. So with that, uh, I'll pass it back to the MC so that uh, we can start with the session uh, led by Johan. Thank you, Dr. Etikan. Without further ado, I would like to invite Dr. Johan to take the stage and share his insights. Thank you. Um, thanks, uh, Anil. Thanks, Etikan, for the introduction and the kind words. Um, let me share my screen. Yes, 
All right. Okay, so I guess we can see um, my, my screen now. And yet yeah, today I'm going to talk about generative AI for real world application and give you some tips and hints how to get started to build your own next generation AI system. Um, we've got a, a fair bit of material that I'd like to, to cover with you today. First of all, we'll see a quick introduction on Gen AI and uh, LLMs. Then we we'll move right away to text generation. So that's where LLMs are shining. Like uh, I'm sure you are all aware of ChatGPT, for instance. So I give you uh, an idea of the tools you need to develop your own chatbot. Text generation is one part of the Gen AI wave, right? On the other side, you've got text to image with the diffusion models. I'm sure you heard about stable diffusion, DALI, Midjourney, those kind of things. So I'm going to share a little bit with you. And um, text generation, text to image, they are just the beginning. There are many other forms of generative AI that can help you in your uh, business. That's what we're going to, to cover at the end. Of course, building those AIs, that's only half of the game. You need also to be able to deploy those and start serving those models for your user. And you see how you can use some tools to accelerate the inference and get real time or even faster than real time performances. And then we, we follow up with some uh, Q and A. So let's start with uh, a quick introduction on uh, generative AI and LLMs. First of all, what are those terms? Um, well, Gen AI and LLMs, they are here to help you create new content. So you should see them as a core author, right? Or a tool that will help you design or build something new. That thing can be a, a chatbot, can be text summarization, can be a translation engine, can be something to help you design new tools or uh, even parts for uh, a mechanical pro project so, uh, or something to create 3D assets. So at the end of the day, Gen AI and LLMs are really here to help you build and generate new things. And they will help you unlock new opportunities. So on the left side here, you have a typical example of what a chatbot can look like using generative AI. So if you start asking the chatbot, how has NVIDIA contributed to the acceleration of AI? ChatGPT or Megatron or GPT or Llama will think a little bit and give you an answer after maybe one or two seconds. And the answer that you can see here uh, on Okay. NVIDIA has been a pioneer in the field of AI since the beginning. Our GPU platform has enabled the rapid development of AI, etc. Et it's all generated by an AI that has been trained on terabytes of data. It has been being able to make sense of all the unstructured data that we have fed it and uh, is able to, to create patterns and answers. So that kind of uh, models are built on top of large language models and they are you many different use cases. Right. Text generation, like we've seen for the, um, the, the, the chatbot here. But it can help you also summarize a long document. For instance, if you have a policy with uh, 50 pages, you can ask it to summarize it, maybe in a couple of paragraphs. You can ask it to, to help you with your marketing exercise. So ask it to generate a few fancy headlines, given the specification of the product. You can use it for translation, right? from um, English to French, to Japanese, to uh, Bahasa Malaysia, Bahasa Indonesia, any different types of uh, language. Um, you can ask it to do it in real time as well and embed that translation service into a smart avatar in, in the metaverse. Uh, if you are into coding, if you are a developer, I'm sure you heard about Google Copilot, which actually help you build um, uh, codes for you, right? You can describe a function, and then the AI will start writing the code to get that function working for you. So it's a huge boost in productivity because you don't need to know how to code or you don't need to know the language, the programming language, but you just need to know how to describe what you want to do in English or any other uh, human language, natural language. You can uh, use generative AI also for image generation. So you can quickly prototype um, images for your brand, for instance, and create some logos. Or you can use that for creating 3D assets for games or for uh, movies, etc. And of course, last but not least, you can use generative AI for uh, life sciences. So um, 
the language of molecules and proteins and DNA can be modeled using LLMs, and then you can use generative AI to create new proteins or new structure that can lead to new vaccines, things like that. Generative AI is something that is booming. Actually, we, we could see that the, the research around generative AI started nearly five or six years ago, back in 2017, when the Transformers was released by uh, Google and the University of Toronto. And over those last five years, we went from research to production. That's huge. That's a very incredible speed. We've never seen that before. And the speed is actually exponential. The way we get new breakthrough or new use case is increasing exponentially. Right? So from transformers, we could build some uh, uh, language model like BERT. Then you can move to text generation using GPT-3. That led to Codex or Google Copilot. Then we could start using it for healthcare and um, health scientists with Megamol BART to generate new molecules. We had DALI last year to generate images. We got ChatGPT a few months ago when you can get a lot of answers from it. And uh, we've got also all those Spanish translation engines. So already that's been incredibly fast. Um, the last year, we've seen more than 1,000 research papers published on generative AI related topics. Um, so what we've seen, though, is that stable diffusion and chat GPT, they brought AI into mainstream. Chat GPT and stable diffusion can be seen as the iPhone moment for AI. Right? Now, everyone can use those AI tools to help them in their everyday life or to augment their workflows, right? You can use that to quickly create a story or a book for children, if you want. You can use that to help you generate code, even if you don't know JavaScript or, or Python. You can use it to create a piece of art, even though you don't know how to draw. Or you can put everything together and build AI avatars. And uh, when I say it's an AI, uh, an iPhone moment, well, just look at the rate of adoption for ChatGPT, for instance. It only took a couple of months for ChatGPT to reach more than 100 million users. Right? We have never seen that before. Um, and ChatGPT, so uh, I've seen a question in the chat, uh, it's based on LLMs. LLM stands for Large Language Models, and we'll see a bit more what, what it is later on. In today's talk, we are going to cover two things for generative AI. Text generation, so that's all about LLMs, Large Language Models, and image generation. So that's the process of creating new images based on text or on other images. And at the end, I will also show you a little bit more. So I've got an, other types of use cases that I'd like to share with you to show you how big that revolution is. Right. So let's start with text generation. Text generation is, well, as the name implies it, is to help you create new text. So you've got an input sequence, and then you generate a text output based on the input sequence. So you can use those kind of uh, text generation models for chatbots. You, you uh, ask a question, and then you get an answer. Okay, so the, the question would be, hey, what's the capital city of Australia? And the answer would be Canberra. Okay, you can use that also to create some dialogue. Um, so you can have some chatbots and you get a sequence of question and answer that will help you solve a problem. Um, text generation that can be also for summarization. You put a very, very large document, 50 pages. You ask uh, the, the AI to summarize it for you, maybe in one page, right? To better understand the insurance policy of your house or what that is entitled when you buy a car, what's in the contract. Uh, translation is another obvious case. Actually, that was the very first use case for transformer models that are the basis of um, uh, large language models. You take one sentence, one input in English, and then it outputs in another language, for instance, or vice versa. You can use that to translate all the Wikipedia articles in your own language, which gives you a huge uh, access to information. And you can use it for, for coding, right? So coding something, a code, is just another language. It's basically using a translation from human language to a machine uh, language. And at the base of that is large language models. So what are those? Large language models are neural networks, so models 
that has billions to trillions of parameters. Because they've got so many parameters, they have a big capacity. It means that they can be trained on a very large data set and they can crunch those numbers and can summarize those data sets very, very well. You can use them to translate, predict, generate text, create new knowledge because they are able to find the pattern inside those data sets, right? And the bigger the model, the more parameters they have, and the bigger the data set you can predict, the more generalizable it is, the more powerful it's going to be. If you got, if you want an example of NLMs for large language model, ChatGPT is probably the most popular one at the moment. It's the most advanced chatbot that is publicly available. It allows you to have some natural conversation with it, and behind the scene, it relies on GPT 3.5. Um, as of last week, GPT-4 has been also released and you can start interacting uh, with it. But if you use the vanilla chat GPT, that's still GPT-3.5. Chat GPT, one of the key uh, features, or why it's so good, it's because it has been fine-tuned using supervised learning. Right? So each time chat GPT produces an answer, you have the opportunity to provide your feedback. It's a good answer or no, it's a wrong answer. And that's going to be used to retrain and optimize the model behind the scene. So LLMs, they are powered by transformers, as I mentioned. And no, I don't mean the transformers, the robots that you can see here on, on the picture. I just mean those transformers. And don't worry, we're not going to go into the technical details here. Just want to show you what a transformer, an abstraction of transformers looks like. And actually, that's the basic building block of all the LLMs you're going to see out there. So BERT, T5, GPT-3, 3.5, 4, DALI, they're all based on transformers. That's the fundamental building blocks. And that's something that we accelerate natively in the new generation of GPUs. So we've got hardware that are dedicated to accelerate all those operations here. One type of operation that you need to to probably now, it's the attention uh, uh, direction. Attention means that the transformer is able to detect correlation between the input sequence and the output sequence. So it's able to actually look for pattern inside the input and the output and between input and output as well. But that's a way to be able to create links and correlation between words and knowledge. Transformers can be built using two different types of subcomponents, encoders and decoders. So you don't really need to use both at the same time, but encoder-based models are very good to understand full se sequences. So you can use those type of models for classification, name entity recognition, and extractive Q&A. The models will be BERT, Albert, Distilled BERT, uh, Roberta, those kind of things. You've got models that are based only on decoders and are very well suited for text generation. So we've got GPT-3, 2, 3.5, ChatGPT, GPT-4 that are based on, on decoders. And then you've got encoder decoders that are very good to generate a new sentence depending on a given input. So that's why you can have all the models for summarization and translation and generative Q&A. And that's why you will find T5 and multilingual T5 and MT5 for sure. Right. So yeah, you have an idea of what it is, but why do we want to use it? Well, LLMs, they allow us to ask them how they will disrupt technologies, right? So you can ask them, why are they useful? Why are they going to disrupt the technologies? And here we ask the questions to chat, chat GPT, and you can see the, the answer on the right side. So uh, just to summarize, chat GPT says that LLMs will disrupt our society or the technology because it helps you create new AI power tools and services. Right? You can add easily AI into any type of tools that you build. They can be productivity tools, they can be creativity tools. They can be tools for customer support, content creation, programming, translation, anything actually can use a bit of AI nowadays. Um, LLMs are also very good to create personalized learning and education experience, right? They can actually understand your own style and your own speed and your own way of learning and generate 
content that is suitable for you. So it will help teachers to create personalized content for each and every student out there. It can help students and it can also help the teacher to better take care of the, the, the students as well. And finally, it's also very, very good to improve healthcare and diagnostics. I think LLMs, we can analyze a vast amounts of medical literature, research, and patient data. That way, you can come with, uh, for instance, new vaccines or new molecules to uh, help fighting diseases. Right? Uh, for instance, one of the uh, vaccines for uh, COVID-19 has huge generative AI and LLMs to speed up the discovery and the uh, availability on market. Right? So for a few years, it reduced the time to market to 1.5 years. So that's very, very fast. It was unseen before. Um, one other example of how you can use it, that would be the code completion, for instance. So that helps every programmer out there. So you start typing your, your code, as you can see uh, here, with the first few lines. And then uh, in gray, you've got some suggestions from Google Copilot. So the AI understands that you want to open a file and load that into a Panda data frame. So it just suggests to you the, the next line of code. And if you want to accept that, you just need to hit the tab key on your keyboard, and that's it. It can also complete comments. It can be multilingual. And at the end of the day, it's all about speeding up your development. Right? It's something that is integrated in a, a Visual Studio code. So basically, anyone can play with it. So how can you get started with, with those kind of tools? Well, there are a few different options available. First of all, the low-code pipelines. So that's the easy way to get in, to get used to it, right, and get familiar with the models. You could go to Hugging Face and look at the transformer models and tutorials. Hugging Face will provide you with a bunch of examples how to load the transformer model and start playing with it. It will even show you how to retrain those. We have um, at NVIDIA the Nemo services, which is currently in early access. But it's a web API that allows you to play with several large language models for different use cases. But we'll get back to, to that one a, a bit later on. Now, for training models, uh, we've got the NVIDIA NEMO and NEMO framework. Um, I would need to update the, the name here. Megatron is the old name. Um, so NEMO is an open source SDK based on PyTorch and PyTorch Lightning to help you train those AI models. So we provide recipes for you to train and build your own large language models. Megatron will provide containers to train and also to deploy it later. But we'll get back to, to that uh, Megatron slash framework um, option um, in, in a minute. Once you have your models that are trained, of course, you need to deploy those, so you might want to optimize them. For that, you've got the faster transformer library and TensorRT. So those two libraries, what they do is they take the model, it's going to optimize it, Make sure that they can uh, have everything needed to run as fast as possible. It can be by lowering the precision of the computation. It can be by removing some layers that are not um, uh, useful or close to zero. It can be by just looking at transformers and putting that on the hardware, for instance, or applying some kernel optimization. So a lot of black magic is happening there, and it's quite transparent for the user. And finally, to serve multiple models in a very efficient way for the Triton inference server. So again, that's something we'll cover uh, later on. So let's start with Nemo uh, framework to train and do a bit of inference. So the Nemo framework, it's our end-to-end cloud-native enterprise framework to build, customize, and deploy generative large language models, okay, LLMs. So all you need is actually to bring your own data, then that data will go through some uh, curation process and you provide some tools for that. Um, once the data is curated and ready to go, it goes into a distributed training process. So you can take advantage of multiple GPUs and even multiple nodes to train your, your model, thousands of GPUs to train very large models. And then you can, once ready, you can deploy it for inference and you can take advantage of multiple GPUs. So it's End-to-end, -end, it's open source, and it's fully containerized, so very easy to deploy anywhere on your, um, well, on-premises or on the cloud. 
right? We've got uh, a few SCP to deploy that on Azure, and AWS, and Oracle, but you could deploy that in your own data centers and your own DGXs if you wanted to. The, the goal of uh, the uh, of Nemo framework is to help you solve pain points across the stack. Right? So, um, for instance, when you play with LLMs, you will have large scale data. Right? It's internet scale data. We provide some tools to automate the data curation and the pre processing. Um, multilingual data is something that is really important uh, also for LLMs. Nemo framework provides tools to enable that multilingual support. So if you want to develop a model for uh, Thai or Bahasa in Indonesia, there you go, you can use Nemomegatron. Training those large language models uh, relies on hyper parameters, and there are a lot of those. It's very, very hard to find the right combination of uh, hyper parameters so that the model will converge. Well, we've got an hyper parameter tool that will actually look at the hyper parameter space and pick the right values for you to ensure the model will converge. In addition to that parameter tool, if you look at some uh, selected architecture like GPT and T5, we provide verified recipes for you to train your models. Um, scaling is something of, of an issue that requires a lot of technical expertise as well. While we provide the, the scripts and config to run on Azure, uh, Oracle Cloud and AWS as well. And it's all available on GitHub. So you download the container, you have a look at the, the scripts there, and um, half an hour, you're ready to go. Provide tools to help for the inference, deployment at scale, of course. We have quantization process as well to make the model smaller so it can run faster. Um, and we've got full stack support for the new hardware uh, infrastructure. So if you want to use FPA, which is a new standard for uh, reduced floating points precision, we got that covered and it's inside our hopper or H100 uh, GPUs. And we tried, we tried to make a, a lot of documentations available as well. So that's really to try to help you uh, as much as possible to get that ready. So to summarize, the MO framework is end to end. You bring your own data, and then you can use that to train and deploy LLM. Um, it's because we it's running on GPUs, and we know our GPUs very well, you will get the fastest performances, and you can scale the, the model on multiple GPUs and multiple servers with multiple GPUs. It's easy to use. If you know about containers, there you go, a couple of lines of command lines, and it's, it's ready to go. Um, it's battle hardened, so all the recipes we provide are verified and works out of the box, can run anywhere on the cloud or your own infrastructure, and it's open source, so it's quite flexible. Don't like something, you can modify it. So again, to, to summarize, that's really a full stack solution that provides guaranteed convergence and also a lot of evaluation uh, tools. We provide a simple chatbot application to get you started very quickly. And all of that is possible because uh, we're able to provide tools for distributed pre-processing of giant data sets. You've got hyperparameter tuning and model navigation tools to help you ensure the convergence of the models. We provide tools for distributed training with Nemo framework. And you've got the distributed inference using Triton and Faster Transformer. Right? So we can scale really on thousands of GPUs. So yeah, um, just to quickly, a uh, quick overview of the, the different tools. So we've got the data curation and pre-processing tools that will allow you to digest internet scale uh, data set. So it's helps you to download and compress and extract the correct language that you are looking for. Um, you can uh, filter the content based on some classifier. So maybe you are just interested in sports or you're interested in uh, telco or you're interested in, in, in finance. So you're just going to classify and filter what you want actually in the data set. We've got some uh, deduplication process that allows you to get rid of uh, doubles, right? Or any extra copy, you don't care about having twice the same information. Data blending allows you to blend data from different sources and make sure you get a better uh, training data quality. And that's, at the end of the day, is going to be fed to the training uh, process. Next is the auto configurator tool. So if you provide your hardware constraint and your inference time constraint, right? So you tell the, the, the tool um, 
I've got one month and I've got 1000 GPUs and I want the inference to be done in less than uh, 100 milliseconds, then the configurator tool will tell you, you need that kind of architecture and that's the hyperparameter that, that, we need, that you will need, right? So, so it helps you choose the right architecture based on your technical constraints. Um, we provide a lot of efficient techniques to, to train the models behind the scenes. So probably something we are not going to, to play, well, don't really look into details, but we've got data parallelism, so we can split the data set across multiple GPUs. We've got tensor and pipeline parallelism along with sequence parallelism that allows us to split the model across multiple GPUs and multiple nodes. And we also have selective activation recomputation that allows to lower the footprint of the um, uh, gradients uh, storage when we do the training, right? So we know what needs to be saved and what needs to be recomputed. If you can recompute, then you can save that uh, amount of, uh, well, you can save that into memory. You save memory, sorry. Once you get your model trained, that's typically the foundational large language model, right? So that's only the pre-training steps, as we call it. Next thing is to adapt the model to your own use case to customize it. And for that, you can use different types of techniques. So the first one would be zero shot. Right? Zero shot means you provide an input, a prompt. So that's uh, everything um, in white here. Basically, you, you describe the, the task that needs to be done by the model. So summarize the article. You give the, the article here. And then you ask the model to perform the task. Summary. And then in gray, you've got the answer. So that's a zero shot example here. You didn't tell the model actually what it has to do in particular, but because it's so big, it's able to generalize and it gives you an answer. If you have time, it's also a good idea actually to do a few shot learning. So you just provide a couple of inputs and outputs. So the model has a bit of a context of what you want to achieve, and then you can start using it, right? So if it was about summarization again, you would give a couple of um, examples when you've got an input, right, the, the article, and an example summary. So that's what uh, you have here, so summary. Then you can start your new prompt, right? So I summarize the following article, you give the article here, and then you've got the new summary being generated. So that's the classical ways to, to do that. Um, one thing, though, it can be a bit tricky to know how to build on Spawn. How do I um, uh, specify the task to be done, right? For instance, um, if you ask a large language model, what is the yellow part in an egg? Well, if you use a zero-shot response, you might have the answer, this is the part that is suspended in the center of the egg. That's the correct answer, but it's not the only one, right? So the idea to actually drive the answer of the LLM towards the right outcome would be to add some context to the prompt. So that's what we, we call the trend prompt of the context here. We are just going to add a small auxiliary model to the prompt that will inform the LLM towards the right answer. Right? So uh, the, the, the context would be, for instance, nutrition chatbot. So the LLM will, will answer the yellow part in an egg is the yolk. It contains fat, cholesterol, and protein. Right? So that's what we can do to actually improve the quality of the answer of a model. And by playing with the prompt here, we don't touch the LLM. We don't do any fine tuning. We don't need to retrain. We leave all the parameters in the model the same. We just want to add an auxiliary model to enrich or uh, augment the prompt. Right. So that's what we call P-tuning. So what we do is we're going to freeze the foundational LLM. So the model here at the right, it's frozen. We don't touch it. But what we do is we feed example, so input output, so the prompt and the well, input prompt and the generic the desired output, feed that into an LSTM model, so a long short-term memory model or something that can be different depending on, on, on your liking, to generate some token, so context there. Okay. And based on the output of on the LLM, we are going to use backpropagation to optimize the model so that at the end of the day, uh, we're going to get the right answer. So instead of training something with billions or trillions of parameters here, 
we have a very small model with hundreds of thousands of parameters to train. So it can take a couple of days or maybe a couple of hours instead of weeks or months to train the model. Right. So once you've got your model that is P-tuned, you can just <clears throat> use it like you would do with zero shot or few shot. Um, the only thing is the model we actually augment the prompt before querying the LLM. Right. But other than that, that's the same thing. So you get summarized the polling article, get article, blah, 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 and then you ask for the summary and you've got the output uh, at the bottom there. So th that's, that's super, super easy to use. Now there are a couple of other challenges, right? If you're an enterprise, your use case will most likely require domain specific knowledge and up to date specific knowledge. So for instance, you can ask the LLM model, what is the pressure of the tank at 11 p.m. last night? The LLM probably doesn't know what to answer because it was trained two months ago. So they don't have access to the current data. So they don't know anything. It's just going to, to answer garbage. Actually. So what you can do to prevent that is to connect the LLM to an up-to-date data set and continuously enrich the data set so that the LLM can retrieve up-to-date information. And that data retrieval model is something, again, that is very cheap to uh, optimize and, and to train. And that will enrich the LLM model. And so we don't need to change anything about the model. We're just going to actually change the prompt and uh, play with the data retrieval models here to generate the final uh, answer. So very, very easy. Another thing that we can do is also use um, human feedback or reinforcement learning to uh, improve the quality of the model over time. And so you're going to, to generate some queries to your LLM to, to answer, to generate some answers. And um, well, if the answer is good, that's perfect. That's fine. You're going to give some uh, reward to the model. If the answer is not good, then we're going to use that feedback to retrain and optimize the, the model. Okay, so that's why we're going to get a model that is better and better over time. And that's how, for instance, ChatGPT is being trained. So each time you use it, you will see that there is a thumbs up and thumbs down um, icon. You can click on, on the one that you need to click on, right? And ChatGPT will use that feedback to improve its answers for the next time. Enterprise will also require some, some guardrails, right? So uh, if you are building a manufacturing assistant, you just want the LLM to now consist technical information about the manufacturing process. You don't care about anything about politics and sport. So you can take those parts of the data away. And you just want it to, to use some specific grammar, for instance. You want it to, to use just uh, we instead of the second or the third person. So you can just exclude that as well. And of course, it's technical, so it should not be biased. So you, you want to remove all those bias. So that's something that uh, you can do using guardrails, and that's going to be available in Nemo um, services. You can, and Nemo framework. You would, if you want to, to build something about sports, then you just care about the sports knowledge as well, the sports data. So you're going to just to include that and remove everything else about politics or technical information. So using all those um, tools, that will help you overcome the challenge of foundation, foundation uh, models, right? So um, if you connect your model to the database, then, then your model is uh, going to be able to answer proprietary information. That's what we call the inform model uh, for, for name of framework. If it's connected to your proper, proprietary data source, then it means your knowledge is updated all the time because it is information. And it also means you can answer correct uh, well, facts, right? You're going to, to get uh, correct answers all the time. And you can manage bias and toxicity management um, as well, right? So if you start with the, the, the pre trained model here on the left, you're going to customize your model using prompt tuning, using guardrails, using uh, well, adding the, the skills that, that you need. And that will lead you to your enterprise model that you can connect with your own data set. And the LLM will start using that to generate up to date and factually correct uh, answers, right? That allows you to uh, deploy your models for supply chain forecasting, financial modeling, uh, sales pipe analysis, et cetera, et cetera. 
So um, that, that was for Nemo framework, which is a framework that you have to deploy on premises or on the cloud. And it's an SDK, right? So it's something you need to code. Now, if you prefer a low code solution and something uh, using APIs, a bit like uh, OpenAI, we've got the Nemo services. Right? So Nemo services, it's an end-to-end -end workflow to easily build and deploy generative AI enterprise solutions. So generative AI, in this case, that will be LLMs, um, so large language models. Again, you can build your um, specialized uh, foundation model using your own data set, or you can just use the, the one we provide uh, out of the box, right? So those two things, building or reusing, actually, you can, at the end of the day, we customize them. You can add a reinforcement learning with human, or you can use speed tuning, or you can just use some fine tuning, some classical fine tuning. Once you've got that, you can uh, connect your um, new model to the data set in form, right? So your own enterprise data set uh, that is uh, continuously updated, you can connect the model to, to that one. And once it's connected, you can start deploying your, uh, your, your model and start deploying your application. So Nemo services provides a, a playground. So that's the, the screenshot that's a bit small that you can see on, on the left. So you've got a graphical user interface, but you can also interact with it using uh, API. Nemo services will allow you to customize models using P tuning or uh, using uh, reinforcement learning from uh, humans. You can use Nemo services to serve those models uh, as well, and you can use informs for information uh, retrieval. Right? Again, real time, getting access to your own proprietary data set. In terms of models, um, currently we've got GPT-8, GPT-43, 540, and a Bloom that's coming uh, very soon. Um, so GPT-43 and Bloom, they are multilingual. GPT-43, it's roughly a dozen languages. Bloom will come with approximately 100 different languages. Once you've got your model ready to go, you can connect it to your application using a set of uh, APIs, right? So easy to deploy. You could even download the model that you trained in Nemo services to export it and run it on your own infrastructure. So just a, a quick overview of the different foundation models that, that you provide. Uh, you've got a GPT-8, so that's the uh, 8, it's the number of parameters, 8 billion parameters. It's been trained with 1.1. Trillion token and the, the input and output that's 4,000 tokens. And you can use that if you want the fastest response, right? It's the smallest, smallest model, so very fast to answer. If you want something that uh, is for very complex tasks, then you can go with GPT 543B. So that model has 540 billion parameters. So it's been trained with 340 billion tokens as well. And the input and output tokens, that's roughly 2,000 tokens. So a token that would be the number of words or characters that the model is able to, to generate or take as an input. If you want something in between, so the optimal balance between accuracy and latency, I would suggest you have a look at GPT-43. Also trend on 1.1 trillion token um, that is multilingual, so 50 languages, and the input-output length is 4,000 tokens. In addition, we will have a Bloom MZ. Uh, so that's uh, a multilingual model that comes with 101 languages, <clears throat> takes tokens for our profit 2000. Uh, and yeah, that's an encoder only uh, model based on TPI. And finally, you've got the information retrieval. So that's why you, you actually connect your foundation model to your own proprietary data set. Okay. So at the end of the day, with Nemo services, you've got a few ways to uh, customize your, your, your foundation model. Right? Zero shot, few shot, like we've seen before, P tuning, of course, but you can also do some fine tuning using the, the services. So that's why you're going to retrain some of the layers of the foundation model with some specific data set. And you get access to GPT-8, 43, and 543. Okay? In addition, you've got the informed data set. Now, for the um, playground, that's a web user interface that's divided into the different uh, sections. So you would have a section to select your use case. Right? So we've got uh, some 
customize use case already for extractive QA, summarization, email composition, story writing, but also some prompt engineering samples to get you started with how to write your prompt to create a new use case. The prompt section, which is in the middle, so that's where you, you give your inputs to the model, and that's where you see the output uh, highlighted in green. And on the right side, you've got uh, the, the tuning parameter. So that's where you're going to choose the model you want to use for the inference and the customization that, that you build. And also, you can play with the uh, different parameters of the inference, so how many tokens you want the model to generate, and uh, the temperature, top K and top P, to, gen to play with the creativity of, of the model. Right? So that, that's one thing. You can also put some penalty for the model uh, repeating itself um, as well. Um, you get access to the, the WebSO interface, but also you could view the code associated with that, that request by just clicking on the view code button. You get access to the curl or HTTP uh, call, or you can see also the code uh, for Python. Uh, so you can connect or create a Python based application to connect with um, uh, Nemo services very, very easily. To get started with NMO, first of all, uh, it's an early access. Um, so you, you need to, to apply. And uh, I will invite you to, to do that if you've got a good use case for it. Um, and you've got a few pages and blogs and NGTC session for you. But uh, yeah, we will be sharing the, the slides after the session, so you can go and visit those websites. Now I showed you two solutions from NVIDIA to to play with LLM, to get the, the uh, NEMO service and the NEMO framework. And uh, well, depending on the ease of deployment that, that you're looking for and the uh, fastest time to solution you're looking for, uh, you might want to use one or another. Okay? So if you want something really easy to use, really easy to uh, deploy, and something very quick to, um, to be the solution, you can customize and deploy the NEMO services. Right? And the other side of the spectrum, so if you something that is still easy, right, but um, not as easy as NEMO services, and something that you want to actually fully customize is going to take a bit more time, then um, you should use NEMO framework. That's why you're going to get more, the most flexible solution. You can code and tweak everything there. You need to bring your data set. You need to bring your infrastructure. But then you can do anything you want. And then you've got uh, um, use cases that are in between, where you can actually use Name of framework to generate the model, train the model, and upload it into Name of services. Or you could do the opposite. You can use Name of services to train a model, create a customization, and then you can download it and deploy it on your own infrastructure. Right? So those two services uh, and framework, they can work very well together. Uh, we've got plenty of resources and, and GTC talk uh, that, that we can share with you. So all those talks happened last week. So you can still have a look and, and listen to them. On, it's on demand now, um, but very, very interesting uh, resources. All right. So that was for text generation. So now we'd like to spend a bit of time on uh, image generation. Um, image generation, so what is it? Uh, well, that's anything related to generating new image, hence the, the name, right? So that's what you can use to create visual art and, and, and assets with AI. Um, you can use, for instance, text to image. So that's where you've got a prompt, a sentence, and that's the model we use that sentence to generate something that you, that you want to see. You can have image to image. That's where you take one image and use that as an input to create another one based on the first input image. Right, you can use that to modify an existing image. So you can take the picture of a cat and add it a Christmas hat, for instance. Image composition is where you want actually to use in painting and out painting to change some particular detail inside an image. So in painting would mean that you might want to, uh, for instance, change the color of the dress of the lady on, on the right side. Out painting would be to extend the, the frame, but still keeping uh, the uh, inner details the, the, the same. So the, that, that can be used in many different types of uh, industries and categories, right? It can be used for the, in the game industry and the 3D VFX industries to create, to rapidly prototype new design and concepts, generate new texture, material, etc. It can be used by uh, marketing and, and graphic designers as well to create quickly prototypes for new campaigns, to create uh, new messaging and, and new um, uh, teams very, very quickly. 
can be used by the manufacturing process. So you, you need, if you want to generate or to create a new piece or new component, and you know the, um, the constraint for it, then you can use generative AI to actually design or generate that component for you. That enables fast prototyping. Um, of course, creating new images is to art, so you can also use that in the fashion for the design and architecture. And you can actually uh, use uh, image generation to create um, different types of um, atmosphere for a room by just changing the, the texture of the, the material being used for, for the walls, for instance, right? or using AI to change the lighting. And uh, yeah, you can play with uh, image generation to edit your, your pictures with in painting and out painting or change the, the, the style. Okay, so there is plenty of uh, use cases there. Same with uh, text generation. Um, you have many ways to get started um, from the easy to, to the hard one, right? So you've got no code solution. Um, you can go to the DALI or Mid Journey website. Okay, so you just go there. Um, you get some, some free tests. You, you can try the stable diffusion demo on Hugging Face uh, as well. So many ways to, to get started with no code solution. You can even download some of the software like Automatic 111 on your desktop and start playing with it. If you want a bit more control and start building your own models, you've got low code pipelines. And for that, you have the Hugging Face diff diffuser, very easy to use again. A lot of tutorials to show you how to download and run the model and also how to retrain it, to adapt it to your needs. Once you have your model trained, you want to deploy and optimize it. So for that, you could try turn and TensorRT, and you'll see that later on. And um, you can also import everything into your creative workflow using uh, uh, Omniverse. But the thing about image generation, it's all about prompt engineering. Right. So prompt engineering, it's uh, how do you write the correct question or the correct command to the AI models? Right. So how do you describe an idea in words that can interface art and design terminology with AI? So you can actually divide a prompt into different components. So on the left side, you've got a cowboy space doc plus 2D anime style, space colors, vivid colors, atmosphere, highly detailed portrait minus some parameters. So the first thing to, to see is you've got a concept, a cowboy space dog, that's in blue. Then you want to combine that concept with a descriptor. So that's what you have in the orange box there. That's why you've got the style you want to achieve. And then you've got some parameters for the, the model here that was for uh, mid journey. Um, and using that, you get the nice dog on the, the left side here. So that's really an example of, of mid journey. So if you use that particular prompt to mid journey, because there is some randomness happening, you would get something similar, but not the same. There are many tools available out there, very um, uh, well known. Nowadays, we've got stable diffusion. Um, stable diffusion provides many tools. So the first one would be the text to image. So you just type something, a prompt, and you get your first image. So that's why you can start with a concept. Then you can start exploring that concept. So you can play with image to image. So you take that image and then you said, oh, yeah, that's nice, but uh, maybe I want the, the character to have dark eyes or I want to change the gender of the character or something like that. So you can explore with image to image. So it's all about generating multiple images based on your initial concept. Once you find something that is um, close to what you want or what you like, then you can start customizing the design using in-painting uh, tools. In-painting means that you are going to mask some uh, part of the image and replace um, the, the mask by something you want to see. So if you want to see uh, a different type of haircut, that's why you're going to, to mention that to the, the model. Or if you want to change the background or the clothes or the, the eye color or the, the mouth, that's where you do in-painting. Out painting is where you want to extend the, the um, initial image. Here on, on the left side, you can see that the character was always cropped at the front of the, at the top of the head. So we might want to add those extra few centimeters to generate the full head. Right? And finally, you can do some fine tuning to uh, personalize even more the, the, the output. Right? 
So fine tuning, we just take the model generation, well, the model that is being used to generate the image and just retrain some of the layers to get the final image there. All those steps, they can work together. So if you do fine tuning, you actually do in painting, right? Or we are doing image to image, those kind of things. Um, as I said, there are multiple services out there. I've uh, got a uh, stable diffusion, we've got Midjourney, DALI, and we also have our own model called AD5. All those models um, come to different styles. So here you can see what happens when you provide the same prompt to those four different uh, models. It, it, similar, but a bit different, right? And uh, DALI is more like uh, Pixar, probably. Um, ED5 looks a bit more cartoonish, Midjourney looks a bit dramatic, Stable Diffusion looks uh, yeah, a bit dramatic as well. Um, you, we can do uh, upscale, we can do image to image, in painting, or painting, we can animate some of the images as well. So all those tools come with different pros and, and cons and specificities. Another thing that I'd like to mention is uh, Dreambooth. So that's why you can actually personalize um, and fine tune diffusion models. Right? So you've got uh, models or images that has been generated um, on, on the, the middle there. So that's, those are original images. You can import your own personalized data set to fine tune the model so that the images are actually taking into account your own content. So you can see here that uh, the, the characters now looks like the lady on, on the left. And that enables uh, a lot of new different workflows, right? So you can start uh, with uh, training stable diffusion on your own data set to create uh, new images of different dogs, right? So you can then start using the, the model for creating many pictures of the dog and pair that with Dreambook to apply different art style to those dogs. Right? So for each image, you can do through here uh, four different types of art. Uh, and that's very, very quick and very fun to, to play with. One thing that's been a challenge was to control the outputs of the, the, the models. And uh, one of the latest breakthroughs is control next. So if you give a prompt and also an input image to uh, control net, when well, it's able to use the, the edges there to create an initial model, or initial uh, representation of what you want to create, then you can use that uh, as image to image um, generation to improve the, the, the image until you are happy with it. So here we apply control net with the normal mapping. So we want to extrapolate the texture of the, the little animal that has been created there. Once we are happy, we can apply some upscaling to make sure we've got a 4K image that we can use as a wallpaper or we can share with uh, our friends. Edify is able to do a, a lot of those things, so text to image and image to image, but uh, where AD5 really shine, it's painting with words. So you can just draw on the canvas on the left uh, and, and say that different colors correspond to different concepts. So the blue would be space, the gray would be the moon, then we've got color orange for cowboy hat, then you've got the, the dog face in red, and you've got the space suit in green. And AD5 will use those as a way to control the uh, final uh, image. So you just need to imagine a concept, drawing like your five-year-olds, and Edify will generate a very high quality art for you. Edify is something that's going uh, to be into uh, Picasso, which is a cloud service for AI powered image, video, and 3D applications. So you can you will be able to use Picasso to do text to image, like what we've seen before, but also text to video and text to 3D. So you will be able to create a 3D object based on the prompt. And just let, let's have a quick look at... Um... Generative AI is transforming how visual content is created. But to realize its full potential, enterprises need massive amounts of copyright cleared data, AI experts, and an AI supercomputer. NVIDIA Picasso is a cloud service for building and deploying generative AI-powered image, video, and 3D applications. With it, enterprises, ISVs, and service providers can deploy their own models. 
we are working with premier partners to bring generative AI capabilities to every industry. Organizations can also start with NVIDIA Edify models and train them on their data to create a product or service. These models generate images, videos, and 3D assets. To access generative AI models, applications send an API call with text prompts and metadata to Picasso. Picasso uses the appropriate model running on NVIDIA DGX Cloud to send back the generated asset to the application. This can be a photorealistic image, a high-resolution video, or a detailed 3D geometry. Generated assets can be imported into editing tools or into NVIDIA Omniverse to build photorealistic virtual worlds, metaverse applications, and digital twin simulations. With NVIDIA Picasso services running on NVIDIA DGX Cloud, you can streamline training, optimization, and inference needed to build custom generative AI applications. See how NVIDIA Picasso can bring transformative generative AI capabilities to your applications. So just to summarize, Picasso uh, is something you can use to add generative AI or for application, right? And that's really for uh, image generation, video generation, and 3D asset uh, generation. That should be something very useful to add to your design process, for, for instance. And uh, it will also help you to optimize your model for real-time or faster than real-time inference. Also, um, it can be nicely integrated with NVIDIA Omniverse that can be used for digital twins and uh, if you're interested in Omniverse, there has been a talk previously done um, by my colleagues. And if you want the, the recordings, you can ask uh, Jack, Jacob and Novorian here. So if you want to learn more about uh, image generation, you get a lot of interesting talks, again, from the previous uh, GTC. Now, I'd like to just quickly go through different types of other generative AI that can be relevant uh, to many different types of, of business. First one, and that's a big one, uh, it's uh, about early drug discovery. As I mentioned before, um, drug discovery can, can use large language models and generative AI because it's just another um, model, right? Another language. <clears throat> so we can see that in the literature on the, on the left side that you get more and more papers and, uh, coming about using generative AI for uh, drug discovery. Actually, that's more than 1,000 uh, last year. And the growth is again exponential. Now, in terms of actual impact it has, well, instead of needing 4.5 years to discover a drug and putting it uh, on the market, it only took 1.5 years um, to in silico medicines to discover and optimize a, a drug. Right? So it's actually three times faster. And at the end of the day, it was even 200 times cheaper because you compress the time you need it to find the drug, where to target it, to lead it, and then to optimize it. To do that process, we've got the NVIDIA BioNemo service, which is very similar to uh, NVIDIA service, but only targeting uh, drug discovery. Okay, so you've got um, nine BioNemo models that you can use uh, via our web, specific uh, user interface or the APIs that can be used for this drug discovery application. And that is very well integrated before NVIDIA DGX Cloud. Um, we've got models also to reconstruct, um, uh, reconstruct uh, scenarios in, in, in 3D. So you just take a couple of uh, still images and then you can reconstruct in matter of seconds the environment in, in 3D. So everything that you can see here, so the, the, the tree animation, those are actually 3D model that has been generated with NVIDIA NERF. And all it took is a few images that you put into NERF, apply the, the NERF model, and it generates that, that kind of models there. So everything can be also exported into meshes and put that into your 3D model if you want, or you can just play with NERF um, as it is. On the bottom right, you can see an example of the, the graphical user interface. So it's very simple to use. It's available on Windows and uh, Linux. You just need a, a GPU. Once you've got your NERF model, you can also play with instruct NERF to NERF. So you could actually uh, modify in real time your NERF model. It's like image to image, but here it's NERF to NERF. So you've got three models, you add a stash, 
you can change the model to bronze stature. Um, you, you can play many different types of uh, tra transformation. So again, very, very fun to play with. To create 3D assets, we've got other tools uh, as well, like Magic 3D. So you just need a, a prompt, right? Uh, for instance, a blue poison dart frog sitting on a water lily. And Magic 3D will generate the model that, that is here. Right. So you can use Magic 2D to generate any type, well, a lot of different types of assets just based on an ID. And once you've got your 3D model, uh, like the one here, the squirrel wearing a leather jacket riding a motorcycle, you can even start editing it prompt. So instead of a squirrel, maybe you just want to see a bunny. Right? You just need to change that, that, that prompt. And it comes with many other types of editing functionalities. Um, Text to home is another example of using a nerf for generative AI. So you just need to describe a room, like a living room with a lot of bookshelves, couches, and, and small tables. And the model will generate a nerf representation of that, that room that, that you want to see. On the right side, you've got the output of a text to home for editorial style photo, resting farmhouse, living room, stone, fireplace, wood. Leather, wood, editor, cell photo, I love it, cost that. So everything you see again there is 3D and it did not exist before. It's not based on, on, on existing images like the model I showed you before. It's something that has been generated by the model. You can uh, use the uh, generative AI to compose music, for instance. So if you listen to This music has been generated by uh, a model that is publicly available on Hagenfest. So you just need to select a couple of instruments. You can give a prompt, and then there you go. You've got your music being generated for you. Uh, it's not about um, music and then only. It's also about create, being able to create synthetic data. So you could use generative AI and LLMs to generate quickly tabular data, right? So if, if you provide a, a prompt with a sample, um, Raw or for the data you want to see, then you can create very quickly large data set to test your models or to test your pipelines. Um, you can also use um, conversational AI, LLMs, speech recognition, or text to speech to create bots or smart assistants. Um, so I'm going to go very quickly here, but you can see the output on the left an interaction between a bot and, and a user. What you don't see here is the interaction was used, uh, what was done with voice. So the user was just speaking to the bot, and then there's a transcription. And the smart AI analyzed that. And the transcription generates an answer, and then uh, use text to speech to give the answer using an artificial voice. Right? So that's called Viva Bot Maker. That's something that is also uh, available. Another thing that can be done, so you, you had an example of music before, but um, there's another one that you might recognize. I'm just going to play for a few seconds. That music, that's the one for I am the I video. That's basically the beginning of all of our notes. And it's completely generated by AI, but it's being played by humans. So in this case, AI is a tool for create, right? You can use everything I showed you to create uh, 3D avatars and ask them to start uh, telling stories. Alice. Well, here we've got an example of Alice. That is the more I am an artificial intelligence that lives in your home and helps make life easier for everyone who uses it. Where do you live? I am currently in the city of San Francisco, CA, but I have been all over this beautiful world. You can see it's so holding it in the unit. How, How would you describe Navidia as a company? company. I think of us like a family with many members that are very different from each other, but who work together in harmony towards the same goal. 
what do you think about generative AI? AI? I am very happy with my life. I have the best friends in all of the world. That's so cool. Tell me a story. Alice had always been a punctual person. She made sure she was always on time for her piano lesson, and she had never been late before. Um, yeah, the, the door seems to be bad, but um, actually you can see that the um, user is able to interact, to interact naturally with the avatar that was in its hands, and uh, the image that are being generated when the avatar starts retelling the, the story of Alice in Wonderland are being generated by Midjourney. So if you wanted to reproduce something like that, that's the basic flow diagram for it, right? So at the center, you've got um, Unity that is being used to render the, the avatar and uses stable diffusion to generate the background images. Unity is able to listen to the user and capture the, the, uh, the audio from the microphone. Then we go to Riva automatic speech recognition, which is one of our NVIDIA SDK, to create a transcription that goes to the Python server to send requests to the LLM service. The answer goes back to the Python server, then to revert text to speech to generate the uh, artificial voice that is then being sent to Unity again, so the avatar can answer uh, using its own voice to the user. So it's, it's quite simple. Uh, we can use uh, audio as well to animate automatically the, the face of 3D characters. So dark. Where? Where is it? I can't. I can't see it. I can't see anything. But I know it's there. Waiting. Waiting. The beige hue on the waters of the lock impressed all, including the French queen, before she heard that symphony again, just as young Arthur won. Okay, I have a few jokes here. What do you call a fish without any eyes? <laughs> um, so this audio to face um, model is actually very good if you've got 3D avatars and you want to animate the, the face and you don't want to use a lot of uh, built-in animation, right? So it's all automatically done for you. It runs on, on Windows and, and Linux and it's again available for free and part of uh, Omniverse. Um, you can also use live portrait technology, so using text to video to animate uh, existing portraits. So let's see what, what happens when we want them to sing. It's coming. Lately, I've been, I've been thinking, I want you to be happier. I want you to be happier. When the morning comes and we see what we've become, in the cold light of day, we're a flame in the wind, not the fire that we begun. Every argument, every word we can't take back Cause with all that has happened, I think that we both know the way that this story ends Then only for a minute, I want to change my mind Cause this just don't feel right to me I wanna raise your spirits, I want to see you smile But no, that means I'll have to leave That's indeed my going. That's my favorite uh, demonstration. So I'll be able to, to answer the question of the deck uh, later. Um, so uh, something that is also mind blowing, in my opinion, is the fact that we can now use ChatGPT into things like Blender or Unity or Unreal Engine or Omniverse, where you just need to describe what you want to see. And uh, you, you can generate shaders, geometrics, uh, scene, 3D models automatically, and, and everything is done for you. So on the left side, you can see uh, ChatGPT able to create a shader that draws a circle based on UV coordinates and able to change the, the radius in the foreground and the background color. Right? It creates all the things for, for that shader. 
On the right side, you see ChatGPT being able to create the code to change the lighting of, of a scene. So that's really, really uh, well, mind blowing. And that's just the beginning. Now, those are the models that you can build and can play with. The, again, that's hyped again. The next thing you need to do is to be able to deploy them and accelerate them. For that, we have um, NVIDIA. So we, we've got uh, NVIDIA Tensor RT. Um, that is something that is able to connect to many different types of frameworks or all the major ones like TensorFlow, PyTorch, ONNX, Paddle Paddle, and MXNet. Take the model, analyze it, and optimize it for the target architecture, whether it's A100, a, a laptop GPU, a Jackson Xavier, a, a NVIDIA Drive, an A40, it doesn't really matter. It's just analyze what's the input and what's the output and optimize the model uh, for, for it to enable a, a very big speed up. How it does that? Well, it takes the, the trend neural network, then it applies different types of uh, operations. For instance, we see if we can reduce the precision. So from FP32, full precision, maybe we can go down to FP16 or FP8, or even play with quantization. We see if we can fuse some operation, we can apply some uh, kernel tuning. So what's the best algorithm that will run on that particular hardware? We can try to optimize recurrent neural networks or transformers. Uh, we can make sure that we use the memory the best possible way. So there are many things that's happening behind the scene to generate an optimized inference engine for the targeted hardware architectures. And that's for NVIDIA uh, GPUs. Once you've got your model, uh, the next thing would be to serve it as well and make sure that you can serve it in a scalable and robust way. And for that, you've got the NVIDIA Triton uh, inference server. So Triton inference server is something that is able to host a wide variety of models. It's quite standardized, basically. So you can input models from TensorFlow, regular Python, OpenVINO, ONNX, TensorRT, XGBoost, uh, Scikit-Learn. So all the major frameworks are compatible with uh, Triton. Triton is able to run the inference on many different types of hardware, whether it's GPU, like NVIDIA, or CPU. And it's able to process different types of queries. Like every application, you have different types of queries. It can be real time, something you need to do as quick as possible, or you can just want to collect the queries during the day and process it overnight in a batch way, or it needs to be a streaming inference, or maybe you need to have a few models working together and do some ensemble uh, inference services. But the goal of it is to maximize the hardware that, that you have, right? Um, so that, that's the high level um, overview of Python. Um, you've got a model repository, you've got a model scheduler that's going to load and unload the models depending on the request and, 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 the, and the different models and the available memory. You're able to pair Triton with uh, Kubernetes, and so it's able to spin up and spin down instances depending on, on the load. You've got multiple backends, um, and you can interact with it using HTTP and gRPC. So very very useful, very versatile uh, inference server. So if you deploy models, I would highly recommend you having a look at Triton, which is also open source. For example, you could use Triton to uh, deploy stable diffusion. So that's one of the models we've shown before. And we've got some recipe to, to do that. So stable diffusion comes with different subcomponents, a clip tokenizer to convert the text prompt into something more related to images or an embedding. Uh, that goes into an encoder. You've got a unit model to create the image into the latent space. And then you've got a variational auto encoder to decode the image that is in the latent space into an actual image, right? So the clip tokenizer can be in Python. The encoder can be on X runtime. Unit can be Python. The VA decoder can be TensorRT. So different components can be different languages or different protocols. Doesn't matter, everything can be put into the NVIDIA inference, uh, Triton inference server. It's going to orchestrate all the requests and orchestrate also the sequence of uh, inference, right? So first the clip tokenizer, then the encoder, then unit, then the decoder. So you can deploy that at home very easily or, or uh, any uh, GPU infrastructure that, that you have. So once it's deployed, uh, you can have, you can start making requests like a unicorn, Picasso style to get the image on, on the right there. So the, the demo is available uh, on the bottom left. So highly invite you to play with it again.
uh, uh, inference for large language models. Uh, we've got something uh, that is highly specialized called Pastor Transformer. It's one particular backend for Triton. And uh, that's something that's been used to accelerate the transformer operations that are part of all the large language models out there. Right? So if you're using LLMs, you can take advantage of a faster transformer nearly for free. Um, when I mean nearly for free, it means in terms of uh, coding. I mean, faster transformer is open source and free to use. And you can see on the right side, the speed up you can get using faster transformer. So uh, you can get a speed up of more than 20x uh, for um, an LLM that is uh, related to T5. Right? So using a V100 on PyTorch or using Passer Transformer, you get a speed of 20, 22x. That's, that's huge. And you didn't change the code for much. Uh, for GPT, G6 billion parameter, you can see the speed up up to 32x as well. So again, very, very huge gain there. So just to summarize now, um, while well, we can use generative AI for many different types of uh, use cases, right? You've got text generation and image generation that are available already today. Text generation, we've got name of framework and name of services that you can use and highly optimize for those kind of operation and, and AIs. Image generation, you've got already a lot of open source models uh, and other platforms available, but uh, Picasso and Edify is also coming if you're interested into painting with words and text to 3D and text to video uh, models. For music generation, we've got uh, some um, partners that are already working on that kind of thing. So you, you heard AI VA today from the IMAI video. And uh, video generation is something that is coming very, very quickly uh, as well. In terms of NVIDIA's generative AI solution, we provide three main uh, services. Got the Nemo service for LLM, BioNemo service for drug discovery, and Picasso services for um, the image generation. Nemo service can also uh, work with Nemo frameworks. So Nemo framework is something you can deploy on, on premises, and you can train models in Nemo framework and deploy Nemo services, and vice versa. Everything is neatly integrated and runs very well on DGX Cloud um, as well. So really to, to finish, I you just I just want you to remember this particular slide. Generative AI is here, it's here to stay, but it's not something we should be afraid of. It's something that is here to help you boost your productivity and creativity. It's here to help you co-author um, papers, for instance, to help you co-compose music, generate images, help you co-design uh, pieces for your manufacturing process that you help communicating um, with your um, with your peers or your colleagues in, in different countries. So it's really something that is here to make your life um, easier and better. And if you have some um, uh, interest in generative AI, again, there, there is a few sessions that we selected that uh, I highly recommend to, uh, to have a look at. Also, um, I'd like to mention our NVIDIA inception program for, for startups. So if you think about starting your journey into AI and generative AI, um, have a look at our NVIDIA inception program. So that's a program that provides a lot of support for uh, startups and, and some benefits. That's a free program. I believe also we wanted to uh, do some uh, poll. Um, we've got three questions for you. Um, that would be the right time to beat Jacob. And uh, provide probably a couple of minutes to do that before I go into the, the chat for the QA. And while you answer the poll questions, I'll play the AI music.
All right, for the police uh, being done, I'm happy to take questions uh, as well. Thank you, Dr. Johan. Um, we have um, someone on the line, so I will unmute him to raise the question. Oh, please. Um, Mr. Zahil? Mr. Zahir, are you on the line? You need to unmute. Yes, Mr. Zahir, you may now ask the question. Uh, we cannot hear you, Ms. Zahir. Yeah, uh, Mr. Zahir, voice um, is not working here. Uh, meanwhile, we can have uh, others participants to raise the question. Yeah, so I, I think, uh, Johan, I was just able to answer quite a number of questions, uh, or most of the questions which came through. So at least you can sit back and relax after the one plus hour uh, continuous talk. Yeah. I think it's a great okay. question so far which came through. Um, individually, we have answered. I think uh, Jacobs have to put that in the in the group as well, so that everybody can would have read the answers as well. Uh, yeah, so you can get started uh, immediately. I think I've given a two page slide to uh, Jacob to share with everybody. So if you're just a beginner, what can you do? And then let's say you have uh, one GPU, any GPU, whether it's a gaming card, whatever you have in your workstation at home or at office. Um, you can actually play around with a simple 1.3 billion parameter <clears throat> um, of, uh, of a model, and you can play with the inference, it's just that so that you can host on your own, right? Uh, that means you can generate your own uh, uh, chat service, right? Um, you can train on your own, uh, you can host it, you can have it, uh, that's just a basically 1.3 billion, still, still a small. Uh, inference, you can do that. And if you have more GPUs and you want to try to host your own uh, uh, large language model, uh, then uh, you can try with uh, the other uh, reference that we have given there. Uh, that's a Nemo framework reference. Uh, the intent is uh, from NVIDIA is you can train on your own model. You can, you, can, you can host on your own. You can provide a service on your own, right? Uh, we just want to make sure that it's a, it's open framework for everybody, for all the best model where the researchers and the AI scientists are publishing. Uh, GPT is one example of the model, but there's many other models as what Johan has shared with you all. Uh, whether it's a text space, whether text to image, or whether it's uh, image to video, or image to audio, there are many models. So uh, take those models, experiment it using our Nemo framework. Uh, some may not be supported by Nemo framework, don't worry. As long as you are using a PyTorch and you're familiar with the PyTorch, you can train it using PyTorch and localize it. Uh, transfer learning always helps you uh, with your own data set. So you try to localize it for your own use cases. Uh, that's how uh, we have seen a lot of developers in the region uh, adopting and using it. Uh, like uh, I'm just working with one of the uh, a company in Thailand. Um, so when they, if you use uh, a lot of content from any of the uh, open service providers, it's not localized, right? So he wants to stay, he want to, you know, he wanted people to go and, and search uh, uh, Pad Thai, right? Or whatever the, the Thai food is. And they wanted a Thai food image to come out next to uh, uh, the streets in Thailand or, or giving a, a uh, view of uh, holiday places in Thailand rather than, you know, holiday places in 
some Western countries. So they are doing localization for their own images and data set. I'm sure similarly, uh, for example, in use cases in Malaysia, you want to localize it for your own content, uh, for own, uh, uh, you know, Bahasa type of structures, a language structure, for example, uh, you want to have it uh, with your own content, right? Which is you bring in your own organization content, you can train it, you can do it. It's possible. Yep, uh, back to the host. If there's any questions, we always can uh, take. I'm not sure whether the previous participant able to solve the, uh, the audio issue. Thank you, Dr. Atikan. We have another two polls. Uh, do we want to share with the audience? Yes, uh, yes, go ahead, uh, audio. All right, one moment. All right, I just launched the poll too. Are you developing or adopting Gen AI? All right, um, one minute, shall I end the poll? Yeah, okay. Okay, uh, share the results. So we have some are developing on their own. Okay, I have the third poll, so I will stop sharing this one. And let me just launch the third poll. It's a continuous question. Meanwhile, Johan, there's a question in the Q&A, uh, which maybe you want to take a look at. Um, yes, uh, so Zahil asked a question uh, in the Q&A tab. Yeah, um, we don't have any support for Rust language now, but you can definitely build wrapper around it. Like Python and Rust, they, they work very well together, but it's not Rust native. That's a good question. You could ask ChatGPT to write a wrapper in Rust for you if you want. <laughs> Right, one minute and um, we still have participants uh, voting the poll. Right, I'll stop the poll. This is the result of the poll. Okay, thank you for voting the poll. All right. Do we have a uh, further question from the participants? First one about how we make portraits sing. As you say, have a look at light portrait technology. Um, it's something we're actively working on. So just watch this space. It's, it's coming hot. <laughs> Also, like to get uh, all participants to provide your feedback. The link has been shared in the chat group. Uh, so kindly give your feedback. It will be valuable for us to plan the next uh, four webinars, which we'll be planning to do every two months. 
starting from the next one start plan to be around May uh, and then after that every two months so your feedback will be most appreciated thank you thank you yeah I think it's a good point Jacob uh, I think based on the audience feedback uh, previously uh, we shared about a digital twin and uh, omniverse uh, in order to create a digital environment, the sharing was done on top that topic, and the audience suggested about uh, uh, you know large language model uh, in the previous session. I think that's that's the reason why uh, we actually focus on large language model of um, you know chat GPT like uh, area. So your feedback for the next session will be useful uh, for us to formulate the right topic uh, to share. And uh, for those of you who would like to see the recordings of the earlier webinars, uh, please indicate that in your feedback form as well. Uh, we can share the, the link for the webinars uh, on Digital Twin. The first one was on Digital Twin. So that will be also an interesting talk that you can uh, watch at your available time. Uh, there was a question earlier. I think, uh, Johan, you have answered about how do you make the portrait to sing? Uh, no, I think there was something you, you mentioned it's still being worked on, right? Yeah, it, it's something we're actively working on, uh, but if that's something that interests you, have a look for live portrait technology um, on any research engine, so you, you'd see what happens. That's going to be part of our Maxine SDK which is uh, there to help you optimize and uh, improve your video calls, um, live streaming, those kind of things. I'll, I'll put the link in the chat. And uh, Zahe was also asking for NVIDIA to, uh, to come to their institution for a talk. Uh, Zahe, can you share your institution's name, please? Uh, no, we can't hear you, Zahe. Okay, there are uh, any other further questions? Um, that's all. So we don't have further questions. Personally, I would like to thank Dr. Johan for your sharing. And after uh, going through your sharing session just now, I feel I'm so yesterday. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> Despite I have been using ChatGPT to write some ideas, and I know about this uh, image to image thing, but after your sharing, I, I just know that there are many other generative AI applications. And then uh, I look forward to the next seminars to share with us uh, how this is done and what are the uh, potentials for us uh, who are joining the seminar today. <laughs> All right. Um, any further feedback from Dr. Etikan, Mr. Jacob? No, no problem. Thank All you. Right. Just for Thank me, you very uh, much. I just right. want to just remind them about the upcoming webinars. Look out for our invitations coming up uh, in the next several weeks. So until then, please uh, give us your feedback, and we look forward to having you and seeing you again. Thank you. Thank you. And we shall end the session here. Thank you very much for everyone. Thanks, Thank everyone. You. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank Bye -bye. you. Good day. Bye.
Thank you, Dr. Johan, for, for this early session. Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, it was a lot of fun, so thanks. <laughs> Thank you, Johan. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's a uh, very informative and insightful. Thank you. I'm glad you, you enjoyed it. Uh, yeah. All right. See you next time, then. <laughs> yeah, see you again. Bye. Thank you, Dr. Dickon, as well. <laughs>